Welcome to Talking Giants presented by SeatGeek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. And we've got our awards show, end of year awards. You guys know how much I love this episode, but we've got some Wink Martindale beef, some beefy beef with Brian Dable. It's The saga has re- reached its conclusion, and boy, it did not spare us any drama. Justin, how are you? Hey, Bobby Skinner. Um, coming off the heels of the greatest speech and rant known to man that you had a couple days ago. Um, that kind of, that kind of took off, didn't it? And you, you nailed it kind of on the head. There's some, st- still some stuff that I want to wrap up with this Wink Martindale saga and this Wink Martindale situation. But, uh, what about these giants coaches and these dramatic exits that they have? Mark Colombo calling Joe judge a C next Tuesday and almost getting to a fight. Uh, Dave DeGuglielmo, uh, was sued for a culture of violence. And now Wink Martindale, uh, there was about a 12, or maybe like a, five six seven eight or whatever hour period where he just couldn't be found he flew down to florida and didn't even resign from the giants position so we almost uh, found wild him exits we almost found him <laughs> yeah, um it was it's very heartwarming to have a bunch of florida giants fans in my replies sharing their gps walking, walking distance, distance from not, Sarasota, not driving florida. you you were all doing your walking distance <laughs> yeah which was great uh before we do break it all down justin this episode is brought to you by some special people joe Furman. i actually went on an official visit to Furman and and you know went to someone like their you know uh not pro junior day uh chris k and the k stands for Kosheski, and then just J. And I don't say that as J-A-Y. It's just the letter lowercase J. Ethan Highman. Hi, man to you, man. Hi, hi, man. Greg Simon. Greg with two Gs. Actually, three Gs when you think about it. Harvey Holcomb reminds me of Kelly Hol- uh, Holcomb, the quarterback for the Browns. Not Harvey Weinstein. Shane O'Connor. Not Connor O'Shane. Kenny G. That's actually Kenny Galladay. Tyler Hansen. Hey, welcome to the show. To, uh... Kenny Galdi, Tyler Hansen, not Chris Hansen. Anthony Smith, I'm going to be honest, man, you got a very bland name. Leo, Leonard Williams, Michael Griffin, Peter Griffin's brother, and then Michael Geyer. Oh, we got we got High Man and Geyer. We got we got a lot of dudes in this. Justin, who are these people? Holy smokes. Patreon.com slash Talk Giants. Welcome, Kenny Galladay, to the Patreon family. We're $2 a month plus some other cheers. You get to hang out with us live while we record the shows. Bobby will send you some stickers in the mail. Plus, there's some shirt raffles a couple times a month. Patreon.com slash, think my voice just cracked, Talking Giants. You'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. Actually, no, we don't do you. You might not be glad you did. So I don't want to set expectations high, you know. Just, you know, just be nice. All right, so Wink is officially gone, Justin. They mutually parted ways where Wink Martindale won't get any of the $3 million dollars. Um, out of, you know, that was owed to him by the Giants and he's free to go wherever he wants. So the Giants winners, they don't have to pay that $3 million of cash. Um, but at the end of the day, Wink, Wink ends up winning this technically because as long as he gets hired again, which I think he will, there was already offset, um, you know, language in every coach's contract where if they get fired by another place, the last place pays the money. Like, so... Like, if Wink Martindale got a $4 million contract from the Eagles, the Giants would have had to pay $3 million of that if they had fired him. Um, and you've seen other teams do that when head coaches get fired, like Joe Judge. Like, I, th- I think there was a rumor Joe Judge's contract with the Patriots was dirt cheap to where the Giants are having to pay the majority of that. But inle- unless this does, they d- like, damages his reputation to where it's hard for him to get a job, which I don't think is going to happen, but I w- also wouldn't be surprised because... I mean, Wink comes out of this looking really bad, Justin. Like, he handled this horribly. And, you know, we're waiting for the full details from the Wink side. But from the stuff I've heard from the Wink side, it's not very juicy. He just kind of didn't want to be here. Yeah, and that's where, you know, Brian Dable winds up looking a little better. But we'll but we'll get to him. In terms of Wink Martin going forward, uh, I, I know for a fact that Wink doesn't want to go he doesn't want to go across the country he wants to stay here that's why the giant shrub was so lucrative and why it was so attractive to him in the first place is that his family is in the area you know around that baltimore area so he doesn't really want to go anywhere or leave the the pseudo tri-state area or this east coast area so um he's gonna stay local if he gets another job next year um and it philly makes the most sense in the world and i will not be shocked at all if he's with Philly in any kind of capacity. 
Which I don't mind. I honestly kind of want to play him now. But I also... I also didn't want to give him what he wanted in this because of the no. way that Wink did this. Like, it's, to me, it's less about letting him go to... Not letting him to go to Philly. It's just... I just don't want you to get what you want. Like, if we played the AFC East, so let's just say he wanted to go to, you know, the Miami Dolphins. We won't play them probably for another four years. Like, I don't want... I would want to block him from doing that. I don't want him getting what he wants out because of the way he handled this. So... Some stuff has come out, Justin. We've heard some things. We've talked to some people. And, you know, the Paul Schwartz article, it's, I, I cannot use it as gospel, especially when uh, he edited the story to where at first it said that, you know, the Cowboys game plan was a big point of uh, contention between the two and, and Wink went rogue. And then he edited it to say that no, Brian Dable encouraged him and his blitzing in that game plan. That's the second um, Dallas game. Yeah, the second, yeah, the second Dallas game. Uh, but basically what is true is that, you know, the Giants played the media game by having the 8.30 a.m. press conference saying we expect Wink back, not announcing that Drew Wilkins was going to be fired before that, and then went and fired Drew Wilkins, who's Wink Martindale's right-hand man, um, and saying, but we want you to stay, right? Forcing Wink Martindale's hand, and Wink Martindale curses them out and leaves. Now, I don't mind him cursing them out because of the, The Wilkins thing is playing the game by Brian Dable. And while the outside linebacker production was really bad, and we detailed that a lot on the last episode when we talked about it and we tweeted about it, Drew Wilkins was more than that, right? He was essentially the the assistant defensive coordinator, which, you know, to Wink Martindale. Now, my counter to that would be like, okay, make that your title and let's get an outside linebacker coach because your position is is regressing and, and performing less. But that's... That's the reason why that Brian Dable did it was to force Wink Martindale's hand. Yeah, I mean, what you saw Wilkins really doing game day, um, you know, you, you would have Wink Martindale as the play caller, and then uh, Wilkins, I felt like he was responsible a lot for personnel, getting guys on and off the field. You're, hey, you, Isaiah Simmons, you're in. Micah McFadden, you're coming off. Uh, you know, Nacho, you're you're in. A. Sean Robinson, Jordan, you know, you're off. So uh, I feel like that was a lot of Wilkins' responsibility. Um, and, and I agree. Like, if that... That could have been a compromise, but again, I I don't think this came down to Black Monday of Brian Dable making that decision to fire Wilkins. I think this relationship and the decision that Bri- Brian Dable knew at that 8:30 a.m. press conference that Wink Martindale was not going to come back to the Giants. But what he said was what what he said. I don't. It's not a lie. I expect him to be back. I want him to be back, and I do think Brian Dable wanted Wink Martindale to be back. And I think the most important part of that Paul Schwartz article, Bobby, is that once there was rumors, right? There were some rumors. There were some things going around. I think it was the Glazer report. Yeah, the Glazer report. Brian Dable goes to Wink Martindale and he stands up in front of the the coach, the defensive coaching staff. And this I respect. Brian Dable says, "Anybody got an issue with me?" And the room was silent and nobody said anything. And I think even if I think Brian Dable, there's certain things where he may have to look in the mirror and he may have to evaluate some things. But that's a sign of a good leader, if that is true, because this is coming from Schwartz and Schwartz is a little bit more of a Giants Giants mouthpiece. If that is true, which I don't see why it wouldn't be, but Brian Dable, like a man, anybody have an issue with me and they were all silent, that's on them. Yeah, that is true that uh, Dable did that, right? And tried to, and went to Wink Martindale on the side and tried to figure, like, you know, and, and, and Wink basically said, I don't know where it's coming from, which we didn't all well, know that that it was coming from Wink Martindale. And here's where it winks. Wink Martindale looked like a huge hypocrite. And Kurt Taylor, intro, at introvert underscore Kurt, tweeted uh, this quote out, which is a good recall by him with the Xavier McKinney situation is, What's the best way to prevent it from hurting the locker room? Because, you know, Wink Martindale saying what McKinney did hurt the locker room. He said, I think we already did that. I think we've talked about it as a group. It's like I said, when I go in there and it's not the easiest thing to do, to stand up in front of these guys and say, hey, is there a problem? Because there's a lot of people who just glaze over it and not even address it. We addressed it. We like confrontation. I like confrontation. And I think that's the only way you can move forward as a defense and go from there. And if you don't do that, I think that you are letting something grow. That is needless to grow. So, And that's where Wink Martindale did not want to do that with Brian Dable. And here's where it comes down to. And I was on Jordan Renan's podcast and he was saying this like it's a defense. 
Wink Martindale just didn't want to be here. And he had made up his mind that he didn't want to be here. He didn't believe in Brian Dable as a coach. He didn't believe in the way they were running a program. And this even dates back to, you know, training camp last year. And never made an effort to get it, make it better. Right? right? Like, And that's that's bullshit. That is bullshit to me. And honestly, I think Wink Martindale got too big for his britches. Where it's like, man, you're a good defensive coordinator. You've coached some good defenses, but... You you aren't Bill Belichick, you know. You're not you're you're not a head coach, right? So you can have some disagreements and talk about wanting to leave after the season or whatever, but to basically just you know close out your head coach and and spend make no effort to make this relationship better, that's that's bullshit from Wink Martindale. Even yeah. if there was like, hey, I, I'm I want to be out of here at the end of the season, but to just close down and make no effort to make it a better relationship while you were here. That's bullshit. Yeah, and I think the word that Schwartz used was fiefdom, which I'm not gonna lie, I have to, I had to like look that up because that's a new word that I never freaking heard of it before. Um, and it's as an area, area, realm, domain, department, element, kingdom, walk, field, sphere, territory. So what I'm guessing is that you know, because Schwartz kind of indicated that. Martindale and Wilkins were like establishing their own fiefdom. So what that basically means is that I think they. It was all right, offense, you know, Dable, you handle the offense, and then I'm just gonna handle the defense. And the only person that I really that I really feel I need to answer to is is John Mara. And that's not true. Brian Dable's the head coach of this team. So I, I, that is where Brian Dable comes out of this looking really well, is that he did try and reach out his hand to work with Wink Martindale. Let's try and make this better. Let's try and, and rectify this. And the frustrating thing is that Wink Martindale was not grown up enough grown up enough to fix it and reach out the olive branch the other way yeah yes and that's that's where it all breaks down is wink martindale really made no effort to yeah. fix this now i hey, will say from will the say, brian dable point of go ahead this is something the giants are very good at doing they are very very good at making people now wink martindale could be totally wrong here and i think he is but the Giants are very, very good. When they want to make somebody look bad, they make them look bad. And at least in the moment, they ruin reputations. That's what they do. And man, I I don't know. Because Judge, it happened kind of quickly, but the, that team was so bad. Um, but know, what was like the big, like, oh, Joe Judge reputation? Like, obviously stuff comes out afterwards. But you have to like read through the tea leaves. Really the... Like what was the big like judge stuff that we heard going out? Well, it was the, it was the the QB sneak, but again, that's a coach's decision that that you're going to do that. Um, you know, and the fact that Mayor did say that I'm not going to fire this guy, I'm going to give him time, and then they fired him. So it's like, oh, well, that makes him look that makes Judge look bad that it went got so bad that they fired. I don't want to bring that up. I don't want to bring that up. But I think I think the Giants are very good at. You know, for, for people that they kind of want to, that they kind of tank, they tank him a little. They, they told Sharma that they were going to give him time and, you know, Gettleman threw him under the bus. So there's a history oh, of... I thought you were talking about through the media. No, no, not not through the... Eh. Like, okay, so the Paul Schwartz story, you cannot take that as God. And honestly, it made me feel a little dumb because I made a video about it. And it's like, you just changed a major... Like, Paul Schwartz totally changing this. Like, how does how does that happen? Like right, and again, oh, it's a we huge know that part it's, of the story, and, and that we, and that makes you question a lot of other things. Like, it, it, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So it's like I can't take that as gospel. Now I asked other, I so I like I asked other people who aren't going to do that. I'm like, hey, what part of this is like true? What part of it is not? Right? And they're like, yeah, there's this. Obviously, it's from the Giants' point point of view on this, but here's where we are. But the Wink's point of view is just not that juicy. Where it's like, he no, just didn't not. like him on. He didn't. He, Wink's point of view is like, I don't think he's a good head coach and I don't believe in this program. Yeah. We still, we still haven't heard the origin of besides, Oh, I just don't like you. We, I, I we still haven't heard from Wink's side, the origin of why don't you like Brian Dable? It's just, okay, well, I don't, I don't believe in you, which, and if you're, if you're an employee for somebody and if you're working for somebody, that's not a good enough reason to, to not try your hardest and do your best and follow the rules. All right. But here, here's my point. Why I brought up judge and why I brought up some other past situations. Has there ever been, and this is just like a, a mile high look at this. Has there ever been 
a quicker turnaround, like less than tw- like 48, 24 hour turnaround of, man, this guy's cool, cool wink, good coach, like him, he's an advantage. Has there ever been such a quick turnaround to that from, I think you're an asshole. Kind of cr- like the, looking at this, it's crazy when you just look at this situation from like this mile high perspective. perspective. Well, that's why, I, that's where my rant was born from was like yeah. why is no one why why are we ignoring this half of the story um and then you know the paul Schwartz story i think really set it ablaze yeah. um so i mean you know hopefully we do hear some more stuff from the wink point of view and we can decipher what's true and what's not i still want to talk about dable for a hot sec because i i don't want to just dismiss because number one wink martindale's gone so if you want to He's gone, so he's not. He's not here. There's no point of talking about you know his role. He was an, sure he was an asshole. He didn't want to rectify this. He didn't believe in Brian Dable. Cool, but Brian Dable's still the head coach of this team, and I still think you know looking and analyzing his role in this is important. Um, so here's where I'm at now, and like I, I, I was kind of you know sort of critical of him last episode, and maybe even I, I was kind of just more or less asking questions about you know what happened, and I think we got a lot of those answers. I still think this is a situation where Dable needs to look in the mirror and if he isn't going to evaluate the way that he speaks to his coaches or treats them, which I don't think there's an issue with it, you know, I think you need to make sure in the hiring process that you have coaches that can take that because clearly Wink was turned off by that right away. I guess the fact that the way that Brian Dable talked to him and treated him and that there is a collective buy-in to what the Giants are trying to build and accomplish and how they want to accomplish these goals. Because I think even analytics was thrown in there that Wink Martindale maybe wasn't even with with all the analytics stuff, and and it even goes down to training, uh, the way that they train the players too. So I think that's the lesson for Brian Dable, where it's like, oh, Wink Martindale, one of the best defensive coordinators on the market, let's go get him. The teaching point for himself, I think, is, this whoever we bring in, there needs to be a collective buy-in from coaching schematics to how I communicate to even the training program. There is just a collective buy-in on what we're doing here because clearly, yeah, Mark it's got to be in. either like that or like, hey, you got to you got to treat certain people differently, yeah. right? Like, you know, like is there? Hey, some like Wink is uh, Wink is more accomplished than most defensive coordinators in the NFL, so he should get like some different types. A treatment in that, right? Like, I, I don't think Brandon Dale should be MFing Wink Martindale nonstop behind, like, you know, it's one thing on the sideline, but to be doing it, um, you know, behind closed doors, which it, it is happening, right? Where he's getting on these coaches, like, like, you know, like you hear about, you know, think about your high school, you know, film room or college film room where they get on the players. He's doing it to the coaches. Um, so like, as much as it's, you want to be like, suck up and take it, like, Guys don't want to deal with that, so you're right. going to have to figure out a way to make everything work. You know, that's a part of being a head coach is being a leader and knowing how, you know, how you can treat people, right? Like, and you can't – not not everyone falls into, you know, the same the same uh, area, right? And that's – I mean, that, that's that's in all walks of life, right? Yeah. There's there's things I can say to you and, and, and say to you, Justin, that I cannot say to other coworkers in our company. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, if me and you are heated about uh, bothered by something, we can probably be a little more, a lot more honest with each other than with, you know, whatever salesperson or whatever. Yep. So, um, you just kind of got to go forward from there, but uh, yep. do you got anything else, um, for, from this? I mean, I think the long story short is wink got a little too big for his britches. Um, and, didn't really make any effort to fix this. Yeah, but I just wanted to wrap that up on Dable because obviously Dable looks looks much better, and I and I'm glad. Like, hey, Brian Dable's like I said, Brian Dable's still the coach of the Giants, and Wink Martindale's not a coach on the Giants. So I'm glad Brian Dable. It seems like he extended out that olive branch to try and make things better, and Wink was the one to be like, no, I don't, I don't want to, which sucks because Wink is a good coach, but I also don't want to. I'm sure there's a lot of other Giants shows, and maybe even a lot of Giants fans that are really plugged in, being like. Oh, Wink Martindale's just the asshole, and he's the one that deserves all the blame. It's like, no, I, I still think Dable needs to evaluate the process and, you know, and, hey, this this time around with defense coordinator and even offensive line coach and special teams coordinator, and he didn't even look for a special teams coordinator to begin with, this time around making sure that there is a collective buy-in and for how much that they talk about collaboration, for how much they talk about communication, that needs to be at the forefront of 
who you, you know, how you bring guys in, who you bring in, and how bought in they are. Hello, we recorded part one of this show all about Wink Martindale, and it turns out that Carmen Brasillo was hired as the Giants' offensive line coach. But before we talk about him, we got to talk about SeatGeek. Today's episode is sponsored by SeatGeek. If you don't know what SeatGeek is, they're a ticketing app that makes buying tickets super simple. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek, they're the number one rated ticketing app in the world. There's no questions that are asked. They are number one. They have more than 70,000 events every single day on the app, including sports, concerts, festivals, and so much more. They always want to make sure that you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, Look for the green dots. Do not click on the red dots. You are dumb if you click on the red dots because that means that they are bad. Every ticket, they're backed by the buyer guarantee. And SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. We've got the hookup. Use code GIANTS for $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code GIANTS. Click the link in the description to download the app. We wanted to talk awards, but Bobby Skinner, there was breaking news. The Giants found their own line coach. I know. I'm very sad. I was removing the award notes from my Google Docs, and I'm like, man, this is a lot. Now, a lot of that was columns of the votes gotten, so you guys are just going to have to wait to see who uh, won Offensive Most Outstanding Player, Defensive Most Outstanding Player. I was actually surprised at some of the results, which usually I can get a good gauge of how it's going to go. I was surprised at some of the results. Also, most underrated, I'm always going to disagree with Justin because it's yeah. kind of the nature of the award. It's like, well, the most underrated won't get votes. So, um, all right, Enough. Justin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell, you can tell how uh, excited I was to talk about it. So we had to stop the podcast and, and we're recording later now. This is part two. I'm actually wearing a hoodie this time. The Giants signed, uh, her hired Giants, uh, offensive line coach Carmen Brasillo from the Raiders. Um, now we don't know who else they interviewed, right? They, you don't have to report interviews for position coaches uh you know usually you only hear about what it when when they are requesting from another team you know remember when rob sale was hired in 2021 we didn't have any uh interviews reported so uh no one no one even knew they requested to interview Dan- Dwayne ledford the falcons line coach until i broke that news so justin he's the raiders offensive line coach the past two years uh, then was the Patriots, and before that was with the Patriots for a few years as an assistant, the co-O line coach with Dante Scarnecchia, and then had uh, it as his own unit in 2021. Before that, spent uh, nine years at Youngstown State uh, under half of that time under Alabama offensive line coach Eric Wolford was the head coach there. So he is a Josh McDaniels kind of invention into the NFL, right? Which we'll talk about with personality and stuff and the things you hear about him, you know, uh, through the Patriots. Like he was, he was the one who brought him to the Patriots and Bill Belichick. Yep. Um, Justin, they, they've gotten good. He's gotten good results with the units that he's had. Right. And they have not been filled with talent. Yeah. You know, as far as pass blocking, you know, this past year, Jimmy Garoppolo was fourth, out of 43 quarterbacks in pressure rate, meaning, you know, fourth being good, 14th this year. Now, last year with Carr, it was a high pressure rate. And then 2021 with Mac Jones was six. So, and you look at like pass blocking efficiency, Colton Miller was 12th of 90 tackles. Dylan Parham was 13th of 85. Their center, Andre James, was 13th. Greg Van Roten was 13th. And then their right tackle, Jermaine uh, Elamunor, was 29th of 90. So he's gotten good results without great talent. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's one of the major, major themes of Priscilla is that he hasn't necessarily been given. Oh, look at the. I guess Alex Leatherwood. Do you count their scarios? But I mean, he was kind of. Uh, but Alex Leatherwood was cut their first his first training camp there. Right. Okay. And yeah, Alex but, Leatherwood, I don't think he's even on a roster right now. Right. So bad. Um, the main theme that I kind of get is that Priscilla has taken kind of not ragtag players, but not first round, not first round talents, uh, not premium free agents. And he's turned a lot of units that even had a lot of injuries in years past too into good functioning units. Uh, and I think that's the, that's one of the main themes and the main takeaways that we've had within the last couple hours, Bobby kind of, kind of looking into him. I know 2022, uh, the pass blocking was a little bit more of an issue, and the run game was good. And then 2023, it was the opposite, where the pass blocking was, you know, a Raiders offensive line was a good pass blocking unit, and their run game definitely did struggle struggle this year more than it did in 2022. Yeah, you think about it, they gave up less, you know, you can cut the Giants' sacks 
in half this a year, and they would the Raiders still had less than that. Um, I think that's more of a less a reflection on the Giants and their quarterbacks than the, the Raiders. But. Sure, but the offensive line was really bad for the Giants. Yeah, um, for sure. Judging, I, I, this episode to me is more going to be information, right? All the information we've gathered, and not really endorsement or don't like this hire. And I, I would like to get. I'm going to working to get some Raiders people on the podcast next week to really get a better feel of this. But I, I just, you know, so this isn't. I don't have like a feeling of like, oh, this is a good hiring or this a bad hiring. But, you know, you do see good numbers. He's kind of known as a hard ass, right? With attention to detail, like very, very like, hey, you're not going to get away with little stuff. Now that can be really good of like, hey, let's let's fix this issue with your hands, Josh Suzuki. But also could be bad where like, hey, this is the way we coach our punches, Evan Neal. And you don't get to do it any differently because this is the way we coach it. Um, and and when they're hard ass, there maybe less communication, even though there's, there is some articles talking about how he communicates with guys. Yeah. I was, I was going to bring that up exactly where, um, you know, there was an athletic article, Charlotte Carroll shared it. I believe it was from 2022, the end of last year. Yeah. The end of the end of the 2022 season. And he, and he talked about, about how he communicates with players and how, Hey, listening to your players and, even some of the lessons that they teach you or the things that they prefer, um, sometimes that's more important than the stuff that, that you even teach yourself. So that's what he says. Um, in practice, we'll see how that actually looks. The running game. Uh, 2022, the Raiders are fourth in rushing success rate. And then this past year, they had the fourth lowest yards per carry. A little skewered by um, one, Josh Jacobs had a really bad year. Uh, but also like the Raiders quarterbacks, might be like the worst rushing QB trio in the NFL with Jimmy Garoppolo, Brian Hoyer, and Aiden O'Connell. Like they're just like, hey, the, who are the three statue? Like I'm talking statue quarterbacks in the NFL. It's these guys. Uh, so there's a clinic, and I haven't finished watching it. Here's something I really like, and I'm, I don't care. Like this is something I will. I, I love this. He has a whole clinic on using the fullback. Right use use of the fullback, right, and even to, like you know, there's a slide in the beginning of it, like why we do it. It brings toughness and physicality to your team. It limits what the defense can run. It gets them in base formations, and when they're in base formations, it just like like he says, it limits what they what they can do. Defenses are not accustomed to it and don't prepare for it as much. Uh, and allows you to attack the entire field in the run game versus different fronts, right? Because you don't you don't know where that tight end or that fullback is usually going to go, and it sets up play action. So I've been a big advocate of the fullback even before he was uh, signed here as the Giants' offensive line coach. I don't remember what episode it was, Joseph. It might have been one of our mailbags. And I said, go out and invest a fullback. The best offenses in the NFL have a fullback. Patrick Ricard with the Ravens. Kyle Juszczyk with the 49ers. Uh, Alec Ingold with the Dolphins, who, by the way, the Raiders let go because of Josh McDaniels wanted Jaco- uh, uh, Jacob Johnson, who's been the fullback with uh, Brasillo since 2019, the Patriots and the Raiders. I can see him being on the Giants as a free agent. So I really, really like that. And it, it fits into – he likes to run they, – they, they are a gap-rushing offensive line unit. You know, in 2021 with the Patriots, 80% gap, which is very high. 2022 was 68%. Now, this past year was 50-50, but it became that way because when Josh McDaniel was fired, Antonio Pierce went to Josh Jacobs and said, hey, what type of runs do you like to run? He said zone, so they made an adjustment to zone, and and their running game did get better. So I like running zone. you got to be able to block it uh, or else you are in trouble. The Giants tried to run a lot more zone this year compared to gap. So I, I think there will be some diversity into it, but I hope they can find an identity. Like that's why I want that's why I want Carmen Brasil to come in here as a run game, as put together a, an identity for this run game. Whether it's using the fullback, whether they get into more zone, or if it's like, hey, we're a gap team and we're gonna master this shit. Yeah, the fullback thing I I really like because it I, it felt like in my brain that I I had like a heart attack anytime the Giants got into a third and one and fourth and one situation, and you see. The Giants are running out of the shotgun because 
they don't have a blocking tight end on the roster, and then also they don't have a fullback on the roster. So, yeah, let's let's go away from that. You get way more comfortable and way more. I feel like there's so much more you could do on a third and one, a fourth and one, you know, on a goal line situation where maybe you have a fullback in there. You can run. I love how he mentions you can run play action of it, and not only running play action off of it. He said, I think he said on that slide, you can run play action off of it and get chunk plays, and it's like yes, you know, that's that's obviously a huge point of it, and it's a and it's a huge plus. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to do a whole clinic on fullback right here, but there's so many reasons why you use a fullback. It just makes it so much harder to fit up first the run because you don't know where he's going to go, and it's just like it just it just makes it harder for linebackers to read, right? And then when that you play a team that starts getting aggressive with it, you know, hey, that's when you can you know let you know put the fullback out on the wheel route because that linebacker is coming to crash in and trying to stop that fullback from screwing you up and then you slip out into the into the into the uh into the uh to the sideline right remember the lions last year did that a couple of times they 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 didn't complete it cuz i think golf missed a couple of times but remember michael mcfadden was going to like slam down on this fullback and the fullback just would slip out and was wide yep. open so stuff like that and so but basically what i've asking people right who cover the raiders and I, i'll just read some of the stuff you know and I, this is not people who are like sourced up on this but just kind of watch it is he said you know the our o-line was pretty good in the first year with the team but in the second year the raiders o-line struggled i'd also say the development of our o-line uh o-linemen that were young was bad dylan parham was a rookie last year he showed major promise but never developed this year he was a big disappointment. Obviously, I mean, Dylan Parham was somebody I really liked out of yeah. out of Memphis. Uh, I wanted him over Josh Azudu. You know, so said like, hey, there's some good results, but there's also some you know development stuff. But at the at the same time, you've got good you've gotten good results out of those. And then the other guy that I asked, let me pull that up. Um, he said, you know, he was uh, Skarnacki has understudy in New England and got uh, brought up by McDaniel's. He's done a decent job of working with Dylan Parham and Thayer, uh, Thayer Munford, who, you know, some contradicting stuff there. And the Raiders O line has been solid in pass protection with them. He helped make Jermaine uh, Elumuner their right tackle, a starter right tackle, which I'd imagine is a part of the reason why Dable's interested. So not as detailed. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to get an interview with a Raiders person, Justin, to really bring some more meat and potatoes of, of what he does, how he works his pass sets, all that shit. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and Bobby, we, we watched like a 17 minute interview with, uh, very strange to see during training camp, a full 17 minute interview with, uh, an online coach in, in the, in the media room. I do think that we are going to see a rotation of O linemen again in camp because the Raiders reporters uh this the the interview that I watched was in the beginning of August so camp is going on for at least two weeks and media members are able to see it at this point maybe one or two weeks and a lot of them spent the first three ish minutes of the interview talking about how there's a lot of different combination of players on the offensive line and this was at the beginning of this year and I believe it was 2022 that they had constant injuries and constant turnover on that offensive line um so you know Raiders reporters are wondering why there seemed to be such a lot of different of line combinations Brasillo explained it basically at 23 seconds of you know you, you, hey you got to be versatile you got to wear multiple different caps it's the NFL injuries are going to happen and I basically said sound familiar because that was kind of we were sitting there at Camp Bobby being a little frustrated ourselves that why is Mark Lewinsky on the bench one day? Uh, why is Ben Bredesen snapping the ball and John Michael Schmitz is on the bench? Bobby, I, I, I think I'm starting to really, really like come to the, not even realization because I still have my opinion that continuity is great and continuity is the best. But because of how many NFL injuries there are in today's game, you're not going to have the same five all year long. So cross-training and versatility, it seems to be something that Joe Shane values, and it seemed to be that's like what they did during this year's training camp, and it seemed to be Carmen Brasillo ran his training camp in a similar matter where all those guys were kind of cross-training with each other and learning how to play with each other. And that kind of sucks because in today's NFL, you don't get that much practice time on the field. Here's where I agree and I disagree with that. I think... You need to have – you go into camp with your five. Those five guys that you go into camp with, they play only that position. 
right now if you have a position battle where you want to put a you know a, a left guard like hey this a true position battle not a for shits and giggles like you know a camp battle right just like but like truly think hey we we want to see who wins on this then that battle those two guys should only be playing that position right and this is where the giants not having a center or another backup they trusted at guard really screwed them because they just moved Ben Bredesen all over and then they started switching everyone over so now if if you got someone who's a backup, a utility player, like, right, and I think the Giants should bring back Ben Bredesen, hopefully as a backup. Hopefully as a backup, hey, mo- let him go at left guard and right guard in camp, but don't practice him with the starters. But just let him practice at left guard and right guard with the backups um, if he's a true backup. That's where I'm at. Where, But I disagree with how the Giants handled it this year, how they did the year before where they, they rotated Gates and Bredesen in game. I disagreed with... Uh, and after a while, I started disagreeing with the way Judge did it, where they were rotating guys in game. I I don't believe in ever rotating guys in game. Every like ninety eight percent of O line people uh, say that. It's basically the only people that don't come to the, from this fucking Patriots bloodline. <laughs> and Brasillo comes from the Patriots bloodline. Yeah, exactly. I like, guess like the only people who are, are who are like for like moving these guys all over is that right and. You know, I don't. I don't blame Bobby Johnson for that either. Like, I, that's a Brian Dable initiative, right? Bobby Johnson's not going rogue and deciding to rotate and do like that's a Brian Dable initiative. Um, so, like, I, I hope that that's initiative that does not continue. I hope they can find their five, get their five, play their five, and then let backups cross train and move all over. Because again, like you said, you don't know when someone's going to go down and where they're going to go down. Right, right. I, I guess cross trading responsibly, but it, it seems like at least from how. From how insistent the Raiders reporters in this interview that they were asking him about it, it seems like something similar was happening in Raiders camp last year that was also happening in Giants camp, where guy guys were lining up in positions that they normally wouldn't line up and ideally wouldn't line up in, and that's what the Raiders reporters were asking about. Um, a line that I liked that he said in that interview, too, is, you never have it, and I put, like, kind of have it in quotes, like, you never have it like the skill set and things that are required to do the position well are not natural so you really have to work at them so no matter if you're a five-year vet 10-year vet or a rookie um, you never have it you always have to be you always have to be working on them Um, and then also you know for I will believe you know those people that say that oh you know maybe a little bit of a hard ass but there was this one Raiders reporter that kind of went on and on about uh, calling him the offensive lines therapist and getting to these, getting to know these guys as people. And it seems like Brasillo, even in meetings, will talk about like, hey, I, you know, even talk about his like relationship, even with his wife and take, make sure that you're taking care of the stuff off the field. And it, you know, it matters just as much as on the field, you know, and, and making sure that you're good. So I don't know. Um, you know, hearing after hearing, you know, we had an initial conversation after he was hired, Bobby, about oh, he's a hard ass and stuff like that. But then to hear the Raiders reporter refer to him as the offensive line's therapist, and they can come with him with issues and shit like that, um, could mean something. Could mean any. Could mean nothing. It also could just mean that that Raiders reporter was trying to write a story, um, and that's and that's what he was asking him about that for. So, well, and that's some stuff hope, from the interview. Well, hopefully there is a balance, right, where he can be an outlet for them and not right. be because you can't you can find a balance right where you're a hard ass in practice in the meeting room and then you are friendly with your guys outside of that like I, my college coach was kind of like that um but then you also have the coaches like Columbo who was kind of buddy buddy all the damn time right. and then on the flip side of that you got Googe who was just a dickhead, who they hated. None of, you know, they just didn't like, they did not like seeing his face, that type of hard ass. So hopefully, hopefully Brasillo has, has the good balance on that. Can I tell you the thing that I'm most encouraged by? Just with limited information and on the outside looking in. The thing that I'm most encouraged by is that, number one, there was a positive athletic article written on him. Doesn't mean the world. But then number two, in response to that athletic article, or athletic article that was written, positive comments from Raider fans. And then also, uh, shout out Monty, our guy Monty, who pulled up Raiders Reddit. There are Raiders fans that are not happy that they're losing a positional coach uh, and, a, and a good positional coach and one that's very important in Karma Priscilla, at least from this one Raiders fan's perspective. And basically saying... 
you know, um, you know, hey, this guy, you know, basically uh, that's five players. You don't have to worry about cat or are they are right, little, little, hold on one second. Um, his offensive lines have always punched way above their weight. And that is an encouraging, that's an encouraging line to hear where Bobby, we talked to our, those cover, our, our cover one guys from Buffalo after we hired Bobby Johnson. And the main message was, yeah, you guys can have them. Not, not exactly an advantage for us. So at least seeing Raider fans being somewhat discouraged that this guy is leaving, that's a positive sign. Yeah, I mean, we, I remember when we, because we hired all the Bills. I actually mentioned it. I, I messaged Anthony today of Cover One, and I was like, I missed the Giants hiring all the Bills players because you guys were amazing. Yeah. Like, they did not care about losing Bobby Johnson. Shea Tierney, they spoke highly of, right? And Shea Tierney was an assistant QB coach. Like, they, they spoke highly of everyone besides besides old OG Bobby Johnson. Um, so... All right, Justin. Do you have anything else? Anything else on Carmen Brasillo, the Giants' new O line coach? Again, I'm I'm going to work to get an interview with not just someone from the Raiders that covers the Raiders, like someone. Remember, we interviewed like some random, like newspaper journalist of like that covered the Louisiana Raging Cajuns for Rob Sale. Oh yeah. Can I admit something? Yeah. So the Raging Cajuns' assistant offensive line coach had died in 2020. Okay. And I had no clue, right? But I looked at Rob Sale's Twitter, and it was like all these tweets about this guy. So I messaged him to like, hey, could we get you on the show? The dead guy? To talk about him. And then I realized later, like, I just messaged a dead person to come on oh. the podcast. I want to mention one more thing. Uh, it was mentioned in the Athletic article. Um, you know, especially the first half of this episode was talked about somebody who didn't buy in, Wink Martindale, didn't buy into a shared vision of an organization. Something that was interesting about Carmen Brasillo is that he spent a ton of time in college. What, what what college? Youngstown State. Youngstown State. A lot of time. Spent a lot of years there. And then got the call from McDaniels, and McDaniels basically said, you know, uh, Brasillo starting kind of at the bottom for New England. Usually guys in their mid-20s have to learn, you know, hey, the new language of an organization and, you know, learn new football stuff and how stuff is ran in the NFL. This guy is in his mid-40s and he's learning this. Um, so I thought that was a cool kind of tidbit that this guy is in his mid-40s, um, finally moved up to the NFL, new spot, new spotlight, new everything, uh, learned under good people for a very, very long time, Youngstown State um, and the New, the new England Patriots included. So that was interesting that he had to go through that kind of transformation um, himself. The assistant offensive line coach is something to keep track of, too, because you tweeted this from the Talking Giants account. Uh, they have Chris Smith right now, I believe. But Cameron Ka Clemens, the assistant line coach of the Raiders, spoke very highly of in that athletic article. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see if, you know, hey, maybe they can get Cameron Clemens to to come here. Um or is it going to be Chris Smith? Will it be somebody else? And also, uh, twice in that 17-minute interview that Bobby and I keep referring to, uh, Brasillo was very close to saying smart, tough, dependable twice. He kept saying smart and tough, just didn't say dependable. Yeah, he called, he described his mom as a smart, tough old bird. Nice. Which I, I thought was just great. Um, that's it. That's all I have. Just that's, that's the ultimate football coach. Like, smart tough old bird what a what a description actually i'm gonna put that in my mom's mother's day card this year you're a smart tough old bird um weird question by that raid reporter what What do you who uh well he asked who did, like who does he like who helped Ca carmen become like become carmen yeah oh i gotta keep I, i'm proud of myself i didn't call him cameron carmen's a woman's name just think of where in the world is carmen san diego Carmen you don't know Lopez. Who that is. Carmen Lopez from the George Lopez show. Did you ever watch the George Lopez show? Yeah, of course. You don't think we? You don't think any everyone else watched Nick at Night? Oh, missed those days. It's on Peacock. I have to freaking get that, by the way, for the games this weekend. That sucks. That genuinely get, sucks. Gotta get like, the cock, huh? I, I, I just stop that. Um, <laughs> makes me uncomfortable. I was listening to JM Live, and you guys are making me really uncomfortable. I, I literally <laughs> stopped listening. I was like, "This is not funny. This is uncomfortable." Um, uh, that's so stupid. You got to buy that. Like, it's how many? Like, I don't care how much that this is not an original rant or not, but it just, God, it's so frustrating that you have to you have to have you have to pay for every app now. 
So not only do I have my YouTube TV, I have to pay for every freaking app. All right, that's an episode. Well, go ahead. I have it free through Xfinity. That 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 was my maybe I have it free through YouTube TV. I don't know, but anyways, uh, that's an episode. We'll be back Tuesday. As, as long as they don't hire a defensive coordinator, we'll be back Tuesday. Would like to get an interview for that. We got to get uh, do the awards. Should I spoil any of the awards? No, don't. I know you want to. Don't. I know. I want to do award. I want to do the award show so bad. I mean, technically, we. I mean, we have like fifth. No, we're not doing it. What? No, we have time. This episode is only. 45 minutes right now. The awards takes like 30 to 40 minutes. Oh, I, I know. But hey, if you really wanted to do it, we could just scrum. We could just scroll right through it. That would be horrible. That would make me not want to do the awards. All right. That's an episode. <laughs> we'll be back Tuesday, hopefully with a Raiders interview and awards. Uh, we will see you then. Until then, let's go big blue. <laughs>